Good afternoon and a very, very warm welcome to you. It's been a wee while, hasn't it, David? It um, seems like it was only yesterday, but I think it's actually a week ago on Thursday. It's much <laughs> longer than that, yes. So, delighted that David's back with us in the hot chair today. My we privilege and pleasure that I treasure beyond measure to, uh, to be back. Indeed, and we are talking about family investment companies for, well, we'll see how we get on. Maybe the next hour, maybe slightly less. Um, but let's see if we can dispel some of the myths. They are becoming more and more popular, aren't they, David? And I think there's a lot of mystique about that, that hopefully we can peel back over the next hour. Yes, well, we'll, we'll try and add a little to the mystique. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, see, there are, these things are incredibly flexible and they're becoming increasingly popular as uh, their, their star seems to rise as that of um, distress, trust, discretionary trusts. Um, seem to become you know, less and less attractive with the uh, the increased rates of tax on trusts, the, the IHT costs of trusts, and indeed the costs of administering and maintaining trusts. So they're by no means a replacement for trusts, um, but they are another, perhaps another um, um, arrow in the tax planners. Um, what do you keep arrows in? A quiver. A quiver, yes. yes. Uh, I think. In, the tax planners, in the tax planners quiver. And we'll just look at um, what they are, um, where they fit in, how they work, what some of the issues um, are on them, um, some of the uncertainties perhaps. But um, I thought we'd start by putting them in context and talking a little bit about um, inheritance tax planning generally. Because, okay. yeah, but fixed, before we do that, David, as always, we, we do encourage questions, don't we? Um, we can, only ones we can answer. Well, uh, yes, yes, we, we yes. obviously re yes. reserve the right only to answer the ones we know. But yes. please do feel free, type away. They will pop up in my little box, and I will then put them to David as gently as I can, and we'll do our best. We don't, unfortunately, always have time to answer them all. We do uh, gratefully acknowledge your questions, and we will try and reply privately where at all possible if we've not had time to get around to them during the webinar. So type away, and we'll see how we get on. But let's start, as you say, David. Right. Family investment companies. In context, well, let's let's think of it. If you're aiming to pass wealth down the generations, um, inheritance tax can be a bit of a um, a hurdle. We've got a nil rate band of uh, 325,000 pounds, um, and a death rate of 40% once you've gone over that limit. Um, there is, of course, a lower rate of 36% um, if you're prepared to leave at least 10% of your estate um, to charity. And um, so there is a point at which if you're leaving a um, relatively small amount to charity, it can be worth leave, leaving a bit more in order to um, benefit from the 36 percent um, rate. Um, there's also this possible addition for the main home, which is now this is quite interesting because this was uh, this arose because of uh, the uh, Tories proposal to make the inheritance tax limit one million pounds, if you recall. We do, and they've sorted by hook or by hook got there, haven't they? It's, it's more by crook than by hook. Yeah, we're getting there. But so you get, it, it, nominally, you get to a million pounds by the 325,000 pound nil rate band, plus up to eventually 175,000 pounds per person for your uh, main home. And which makes you 500, double that gives you a million, which with, in the dusk with the light behind you, um, looks like a million pound um, IHT extension. The um, interesting thing about that extension, just while we're talking about it, however, is firstly, um, you only get that that um, that um, nil rate band residential extension if your estate is only get it in full if your estate is um, less than two million pounds, and that that um, extension, which currently is one hundred twenty five thousand pounds, is going up year by year. That ext extension is then reduced um, by a pound for every two pounds by which your estate exceeds um, two million. And the planning point here is that although the three hundred twenty-five thousand pound nil rate band is can be inherited spouse to spouse, yep. And although in principle the um, residential extension can be inherited spouse to spouse, yep. What happens if you've got two spouses, each of whom have an estate of about two million pounds? Right. First spouse dies, everything passes to the second spouse. Your second spouse then has an estate of four million pounds. Yep. And therefore doesn't get the residential nil rate band. So in the same way that we used to do planning to utilize the um, before the um, the the um, 
the main mill rate band of 325,000. Before that was transferable between spouses, we used to do planning to remember to, to utilise that mill rate band on the first yeah. death. And we still need to do, in, in, in appropriate cases, to do planning to utilise the residential mill rate band on the first death. Because although it's in theory passed across, in, it may be passed across in circumstances that not, it's not actually worth anything. Um, so that's just the... Uh, um, just the point to remember on the possible addition for the mill rate band. Do we have a question? We do have a question. And a question from Sam. Thank you very much. Sam asks, is the 10% reduction for monies given to charity restricted to the amount left upon death? Do payments during lifetime not count? Well, I'm sure I understand the question because it's, it's, it's a tax charge on the estate on death. So to the extent that the estate includes lifetime gifts that, that, mm -hmm. that have become pets, that have become chargeable because of premature death, it will apply at the 36% rate, um, will apply. Um, but it's charged on the estate that, you know, by definition, it's a charge on the estate that isn't yeah. given to charity. Um, so um, do payments during a lifetime, not... Um, an immediately chargeable transfer made during life can't benefit from the 36 right. limit. I think that's, that's the easiest way of looking at it. All right. Thank you for uh, that, Sam. So we've ne now got, what's our next slide? Oh, yes. This merely demonstrates in a rather depressing fashion um, um, for an estate of 10 million pounds with no planning and no reliefs. How um, the um, exchequer can easily be the single biggest beneficiary of the estate with um, you know, three sons. Yeah. Uh, so at 40 percent. Taxman yeah. wins. He wins, yes. Okay. So, so, so merely no. a depressing sort of pie chart. Okay. So right. how do we, I mean, there's, there's, you know, we can have various assets and there's various planning techniques available to start thinking about mitigating IHT. Yeah. Um, so uh, trading businesses, the tra shares in a, in, a, in a trading company which uh, qualify, whether, whether the shares qualify for business property relief or indeed where a business qualifies for 100% business property relief, then um, the most sensible IHT planning is very often to do nothing at all. Hang on, hang on to it. Hang on to it on the basis that on death there'll be no inheritance tax mm -hmm. because of the 100% business business property relief. Um, you, if in, um, and you've got a rebasing to market value on death, so you get a tax-free CGT uplift. You do. Um, so. If you've got shares in a family company, then uh, yeah, hang on to them. Um, I think listed shares can be quite helpful here as well, can't they, David? Indeed, they can. Indeed, they can. Um, we've got the, the, the we've got the, the uh, case of um, Phillips, which is now quite an old case about um, the meaning of trading company. This is this was a case, if you remember, where the the business of the company was to um, finance other businesses owned by the um, um, by the deceased, and um, it was held in that case that that, that those um, because the financing of those other businesses didn't amount to an investment, right? Uh, the shares in the company um, could potentially qualify for business property relief in full. Interestingly, that was even the case, even though the companies that were being financed um, were in many cases investment companies, right? Um, so you've got this, this case of Phillips. I think it's a 2006 case on uh, on loan out companies. Uh, remember that um, if you have an investment company, which of course won't qualify for business property relief, um, it is it will, however, be possible to convert that company into a trading company in principle, um, and in order to qualify for business property relief. And the, and the point here is it doesn't matter at what point that company is trans is converted into a trading company. All that matters is that it's a trading company at the time of the um, transfer of value, or the deemed transfer of value on death. So one can envisage the possibility of somebody having a, an investment company mm -hmm. um, and then maybe introducing into that investment company, gearing up to um, to uh, introduce perhaps a property um, development business, which would be qualified for business property relief and therefore having a company that's mainly a trading company and, and, uh, and qualifying in that way. It's been suggested you might uh, appropriate your investment properties into stock as a method of converting from an investment to a trading company for these purposes. Is that something we uh, 
we recommend? Well, yes, if you can do it. I mean, but the point is that um, merely taking a label off a property that says investment and putting a label on it that says stock and um, popping down to your local um, estate agent and sticking a photo in the estate agent's window, and that doesn't, yeah, the, fact you're, okay. the fact you're selling an investment doesn't convert it into stock. That's mm -hmm. the point. Um, it might be, as a matter of fact, that you've that that's, that you've appropriated it into stock, but it it's, might equally well be that you haven't. So that, I think what we're saying is that the principle holds, but it's the practical reality it, that's it, relevant, it's, isn't it's, it? As, as, as always, it's the, it's the facts that can get in the mm -hmm. way of, of uh, what would otherwise be highly um, imaginative tax planning. Okay. Um, We've got else we got uh, cash um, is uh, so we just sorry Philip's just asked a question about making an appropriation to stock whether that be a disposal for capital gains tax purposes yes it would I think is the answer to that there may be planning we can do to mitigate that um, I think am I right you can hold over the game you can still hold over the game going that way on appropriation yes into, into, into stock um, it's quite difficult to change the character. Of, of assets, either either something moved from stock to investment or investment to stock, and there's, there's, a, there's a general principle that the character of an asset is um, established at the time of acquisition, mm -hmm. and it's 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 not impossible, but it's quite difficult. Yeah. Um, pension funds are, are quite interesting. Now the the attraction of of um, um, with with the changes in the, the way in which pension funds are uh, are um, the flexibility of, of pension funds and the extent they can be um, passed down and you don't need to use them to buy annuities and all the rest of it and pension yeah. funds can now be quite an attractive um, IHT uh, strategy yeah um, so that can be uh, so as a, as a as in principle one might um, say that the pension fund ought to be the last asset to be touched um, in terms of IHT um, planning um, so that you know, because it's outside, it's outside your estate. Um, quoted shares are um, a bit problematic. Um, so we're now moving into things that are, are perhaps more difficult to do uh, planning with um, investment properties, um, commercial and residential, um, with family, with with um, the family home and the and the holiday home. You might look at co-ownership. This is a special IHT relief that um, where the, the um, res reservation of benefit rules don't apply if you transfer an interest to somebody who then occupies the home along with you. So right. if, increasingly uh, nowadays there seem to be um, things like um, what do they call them? Boomerang kids. <laughs> um, um, boomerang kids are yeah in, in IHT terms and um, can be quite helpful. They might be. Um, a bit provoking in other in other, in other terms, but um, where the, where they, the next generation move back, live in the family home, um, then uh, this uh, IHC relief can be helpful. Um, the other possibility on family homes is to take out a lifetime mortgage that's then deductible against the family home and, and give the cash away. Um, but all of these, of course, depend on the um, particular um, circumstances. I have another question. This is from David, who we, I think we know well. We'll, we'll protect the innocent. But uh, David just wants to check the point I think we alluded to before. BPR planning. So if you convert an investment company to a trading company five minutes before death, would that be sufficient to get you business property relief? Um, what do you think? Well, do it with extreme caution. As we said, I think the reality is it's going to be quite a hard job to convince an inspector of taxes that five minutes before death, you have converted the nature of that company. David, well, well uh, hang on a minute. Hang on. The difference between converting a particular right. asset from an investment asset into mm -hmm. trading stock, which is very difficult, it might be much easier to convert an investment company into a trading company. For example, if you've got an investment company with you know, five million pounds of investment assets, um, you might uh, go and borrow five million pounds from the bank secured on the, on the yep. company. On the, on the assets, you might go and then buy five million pounds worth of trading stock. Mm -hmm. You might then borrow another two and a half million pounds on the trading stock and buy another two and a half million pounds of trading stock. Mm -hmm. So you've got a company with seven and a half million pounds of debt, um, seven and a half million pounds of trading stock, yeah, five, five million pounds of investments. Then that yeah looks 
a lot like a lot a lot like it's a wholly or mainly isn't it it's wholly or mainly so, wholly or mainly. so as long as um, you can tip the scales but to answer the question the requirement as to um owning the property is that you have to own the property the property isn't relevant business property in relation to a transfer of value unless it was owned by the transferor throughout the two years immediately preceding right. the transfer doesn't have to have been business property throughout the two at the throughout the two year period so in principle david yes you look at the nature of the asset five minutes before death mm -hmm. um not and, and and that's what's relevant it doesn't matter how long it's been business property so there we go okay good question next so, IHT, bit of a problem, really. Oh, what are the yes. sort of? I mean, there's various standard planning techniques, aren't there, David? And that's what we're just going to quickly run through there. Well, there are there are only four ways. This is this is. Yeah, he like, was counting on his fingers there. I'd just like to point out. Uh, yes, only four ways of um, avoiding IHT. Um, one is eternal life, so that doesn't really work. Difficult. Two is taking out insurance against um, death. So you've got a fund to pay the IHT. Yep. This isn't really IHT planning at all. No. All it is is producing a fund to pay the IHT. So those are not really planning for IHT. The other two really are only to have to reduce the size of your estate or to ensure that your estate um, qualifies for reliefs. Okay. Really, those are the only two, mm -hmm. the only two ways when it comes down to it of um, – of, uh, doing IHT planning. So you can reduce this estate. Um, you've got this question of you can make lifetime gifts, of course. Yeah. Um, and looking at the last bullet point, gifts within seven years of death will be written back into your estate. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, there is partial relief um, for deaths uh, where, where you survive at least three years. From Correct. Death. But remember, that is a relief reducing the tax. It's not a relief reducing the amount of the transfer right so unless you're making a transfer that is more than the nil rate band then that reduction isn't going to help you because if you're only if your transfer is is less than the nil rate band it will still be written back into your estate and there won't actually be any death any tax payable by reference right the gift because it, because it's below the nil rate band so the 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 um reduction it won't help you um so um so you've got gifts within seven years of death will be written back. If some gifts are immediately chargeable transfers, um, so you know, will be chargeable to the extent they exceed the available nil rate band. So in particular, most transfers into trust will yeah. be immediately chargeable, uh, which is what makes trusts considerably less attractive than they than they uh, used to be. Um, you've got the uh, rules about gifts subject to reservation. So basically, if you give something away and continue to benefit from it, it doesn't count as a gift. And allied with that, if you've, you've, you've got the pre-owned assets charged, so if you manage to give something away, subject to reservation, that doesn't actually get caught by the gift subject to reservation rules, then the pre-owned asset charge is very likely to kick in below it. Um, so those two, are, between them, are a, um, they're a sort of... Um, Little and large, Laurel and Hardy of the um, IHT uh, planning field, but the the, the <coughs> normal expenditure out of income um, uh, provision is is quite helpful. Uh, you've got this unlimited relief for um, gifts that are made, um, regular gifts, uh, which which are made out of income, and and uh, which allow you to maintain your li lifestyle. So, expenditure out of surplus income. Yeah. Uh, is uh, there are is an unlimited, an unlimited uh, <coughs> relief. So those are basically the ways of reducing the estate. Uh, exemption from IHT, you've got um, business property relief that we've talked about, um, agricultural property relief. Remember that agricultural property relief is only in respect of agricultural value, and most farmland, certainly most farmland in the southeast, um, has some sort of um, this is, I don't know, exaggerated. Most, a fair amount of farmland in the southeast um, has at least hope value in terms of planning. So it has a value in excess of its pure agricultural yeah, value. I think that's fair comment. So, it? so you've got it becomes important to see if you can also get business property relief to top up mm -hmm. that, that um, agricultural value. Um, exemption from IHT gifts to spouse or a civil partner. Got this limitation now. Um, 
now it's the Neil Wright band where you're gifting to a non-domiciled um, spouse. Um, or um, unlimited relief for gifts to charity. And if you're giving that to charity, then you get a discount on the on the rest of the... Um, yeah, as you say, there's no uh, great mystery here, is there? Those are... That's really it. That's it, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know why Terry makes it so complicated. I know, I well, see, It's dead it. easy, isn't it? It is. Um, so, um, the alternative... Just we joking, often, Terry. <laughs> he won't be up yet. I wouldn't worry about yeah. it. Um, where we often end up, though, and certainly historically, we'd have looked at, uh, it's the use of trusts if we're looking at uh, reducing family estates and planning for next generations. Yes, I mean, and trusts. I mean, trusts are terribly useful things, not only for um, inheritance tax planning and tax planning generally, but also in terms of, um, I was going to say family planning, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, uh, because trusts, the great advantage of trusts are you put the value into trust, it's outside your estate for IHT purposes. Yeah provided you don't have a um, reservation of benefit. Um, so that's outside your estate, right? to some extent you can maintain control as trustee. So if you're a bit of a control freak and you want to give assets out of your estate, but you don't quite want to um, give control to um, other people, then a, a trust can be the uh, the right thing. Obviously, if, if you're a trustee of a trust, then um, that is not the same as um, owning the thing outright because you, know, you may have control of the asset your control and what you can do with that asset is very much constrained by what the trustee tells you you can mm -hmm. do but nonetheless um, you can to some extent um, maintain control as a trustee um, by by popping these assets into this structure um, that isn't directly owned by um, beneficiaries you can protect beneficiaries um, both from themselves um, because you know, large amounts of money at a young age are sometimes said to be as, as much a burden as a, as a benefit. Um, so you can protect beneficiaries both from themselves and, and indeed from creditors. And by creditors, I include um, possibly um, divorcing spouses. So you've, so you've got this, this value that is not um, exposed in that way. And um, there is a high degree of confidentiality in in trusts. Yeah, there's no filing requirements or similar that there would be with a company, is there? No, I mean, you've got, obviously you've got the normal tax filing requirements. Yeah. There's nothing on the on the public record. Mm -hmm. So that's on the green, which is good, I think. Green, good, yes. But there's quite a bit on the red side there. Well, nowadays, isn't there? they're less attractive than perhaps they were. So because you've got now um, relatively high rates of tax, um, both of um, capital gains tax and um, income taxes um, on, tr on trusts, particularly you've got the um, the uh, trust rate on dividends. You've now got an IHT charge on contributions to the trust that are in excess of the nil rate band. Yeah. You've got the um, the uh, periodic charge, um, ten year charge, at up to six percent on trust assets. I mean, generally it won't be six percent because the the because of the way it worked out. But it's up to six percent. Yeah. You've got the potential for an exit charge on um, assets that leave the trust structure. Um, they are relatively complicated. You now need to register with the revenue. Um, and one of the problems, one of the, the last problem, point there, and potential problems with trustees, um, hopefully if you choose your trustees wisely, then there won't be any, any problems, but there, it, it, there can be some difficulties yep. uh, with um, uh, trustees who go off the rails a bit. Okay, and we can... Well, we wouldn't want to exaggerate. No. <laughs> it's, it's a... And offshore trusts can be useful as well as onshore, but perhaps that's that's for another day, depending on individual circumstances. Yes. So yes. okay, so trusts they still have their use. I don't think we're we're dismissing them out of hand, but they're certainly not as attractive as they were in the past. No, people are looking around for um, perhaps um, different different things um, that um, our our, uh, our family investment companies the the uh, the solution to um, to the difficulties that, that arise with some trusts. Okay, um, which leads so us on finally, I think, to to what? Well, what what would you want in an ideal? If I could show you a way, Tony, that gave you a familiar structure that you know how it works. It's simple, um, low rates of internal tax, um, no internal IHT charges. Um, it's flexible, it's adaptable, can give you some degree of privacy as well. 
Yeah. If I could show you a way, a structure of that kind, you would be interested, wouldn't you? I certainly would. Right. So let's reveal all. As I say, that? and there's no great mystery to these, really. I mean, they're called family investment companies, but they are just a company, aren't they? There's not a lot more to say than that, as we shall now explore further. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, they're, well, Mrs. Uh, but they're not. There's not, as you said, there's no mystery to these things. A family investment company is a company um, that's got some sort of family involvement, um, and it's usually got something to do with investments. I mean, it's, it's like the Ron seal. Yeah. That's what it says on the tin. Um, so what we're trying to do here is to use um, you know, a well-established, familiar structure to see how, if, if it can be used to pass generation, wealth down the generations. So... It's a private company, no rocket science about that. Um, it's usually UK registered and UK resident. There's no particular need for it to be UK registered and UK resident. Well, there's, there's little, if any, advantage using a, an offshore company out of thought. It's going to be UK tax resident, I'd imagine, unless you go to great trouble and expense to keep it offshore. Yeah, I mean, it's almost certainly going to be UK tax resident. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it might be registered offshore. Um, Candidly, the benefits of having offshore, it gives you, might give you better boasting points at the golf club to okay. say your family investment company is registered in Guernsey. But honestly, it's not, it's no real advantage. No. Um, could be limited or unlimited. Um, limited company, of course, gives you limited liability, which is great if you're, uh, if you're trading. Um, great if you're, if there are liabilities in the company that uh, might be, that you, you want to protect yourself Correct. from. Um, perhaps if you're employing people, uh, if you're building houses lined with asbestos. I mean, if yeah, if you're if if you want limited liability, but if you're investing, mm -hmm. um, then perhaps an unlimited liability company is. You don't need limited liability. Correct. You're um, not going to get sued for holding shares in M&S. I think is is the point. Okay, exactly. Um, exactly. And that does have it gives you a little bit more privacy, doesn't it? Exactly. As far as yeah. there's no filing requirements at company's house. And I believe you don't have to complete a register of significant interest. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Good. You heard it here first. I think. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. So a little bit more privacy. But look, at the end of the day, for a small company, what we file at company's house is, is fairly minimal. Anyhow, you get a balance sheet these days pretty much, and that's it. So yeah. um, something to think about. So it's, uh, which emphasizes that in most, most of what we're going to say here is something to think about. Um, there is great flexibility on, on how these things work, and they can be used in a, different, in a number of different ways because they are, um, yeah, they are basically simple structures. And we, yeah, you could form one tomorrow, couldn't you? In fact, we could have one by the closer today if we really wanted to one in theory, an off-the-shelf company for a, a few mere a, pounds. I think we have one by the close of this seminar, yeah, actually. Well. Um, not we, nobody's asking for them. Okay. Um, okay, uh, and then somebody. Generally speaking, we'll need to fund it. Okay. Um, we put parents and, um, and it says asked, does it have to be parents? But it doesn't have to be. I mean, we're normally talking about passing wealth down through the generation. So that's why it'd be most sensible. Yeah. But there's no but there's no absolutely no mm -hmm. reason why a um, an investment, family investment company can't be set up for you know, you know, siblings for siblings. Or mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, I can envisage circumstances in which um, okay, I can envisage circumstances in which perhaps a one particular member of the family becomes very wealthy perhaps wins the lottery or something and wants to make provision yep. for other members of the family so this is not as i say yeah as, as i say ad nauseam this is hugely flexible so somebody funds it typically by loan possibly by by preference shares why might you go for preference shares david um why might you go for preference? Well, because maybe. you could attach. Right, well, we'll come on. Well, yeah. actually, we'll come back to that. Okay. We'll come back to that. Yeah, it's probably um, the real question is why would you use loans? But we'll we'll come back to that. Um, now, typically, the parents, if we're aiming to replicate the um, some of the advantages of trusts, and this will not replicate all replicate all the advantages of trusts. Um, mm -hmm. But typically, the parents would want to have some degree of control. Mm -hmm. So you might have a structure where the um, parents have. Um, voting shares so they they control what happens within this company yeah. though they may not themselves um, be able to um, uh, generate a value from the from the company or maybe they are maybe they do want to generate value yeah. from the company but probably not, the most important thing from the from the parental generation is that they control this um, this creature um, 
they might have voting shares, they might have golden shares that um, empower them to be appointed directors. Um, so they might have control both at board level mm -hmm. and, at, um, and, at shareholder, and at shareholder level. Um, there might be, and there typically would be, restrictions on the um, shareholdings of the company. So you might um, sensibly, and, and these could either be in the memorandum and articles, which are, of course, a matter of public record, mm -hmm. or if you don't want it to be a matter of public record, um, then they could be in a private shareholders agreement, which isn't filed at the company's own. But um, the restrictions on shareholdings uh, might include limitations on who can actually hold the shares, that they can't be transferred other than within the family. Um, so it is a family investment company. And only. Yes. So again, all we're saying is there's a great deal of flexibility there. Yeah. So what do you want? And it can all be written in however you want. Um, so that's all all good. Uh, and and, and the, the purpose being to ensure, as far as is appropriate, that value resides in the next generation okay. shares. So it's it's uh, um, the so value is passed in some way. I mean, we've talked about creating different classes of shares here, and I think we should be careful. There's been a lot of debate about the use of alphabet shares, for example. I mean, this this when we talk about alphabet shares, it covers a range of sins, and I don't think. There's nothing here that I think HMRC would regard as particularly aggressive or offensive, is there? These are not the sort of alphabet shares that HMRC would typically take exception to. Yes, we need to plan carefully, but this isn't, I don't think, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries as far as tax planning goes. This is sensible, fairly low risk tax planning. I think well, we, we, well, we hope that this is that this is um, benevolent tax planning. Um, that it's, I mean, clearly. Because these, these things are so flexible, you can, there's, there's, I can envisage ways in which you might um, be seen to be pushing the envelope further than the revenue were, mm -hmm. were comfortable. Um, and in, as the trouble is with any net tax planning nowadays, um, one has to be very aware of um, the GAR. Yep. Um, I don't think I don't think anything we're talking about here would be regarded as being abusive within the terms of the uh, the general anti-abuse rule. Um, you'd also need to consider um, whether um, the Dotas rules were engaged because, in particular, um, varying using particular different um, classes of shares might bring you within within Dotas. But you, all of these things are um, would need to be considered within the context of how you're using these things um, to meet the particular bespoke circumstances. Yeah, and suffice to say, tax rules evolve, so what's good today might not be good tomorrow. And, and there are a number of issues that we'll come to that are surprisingly um, unclear about um, FICs. Okay. But, okay. Um, so typically, but talking about, um, what are we talking about? Uh, alphabet, shares. alphabet shares. I mean, the, the, when, when the, um, the objection that reven the revenue you have to alphabet shares is, is basically following the, the principle of the PA Holdings case, yeah. where what you're essentially doing is paying to an employee what is in substance and economically a bonus. Yes, disguise remuneration. But you're mm -hmm. putting a label of a dividend on it. Um, this is not anything, anything nowhere oh, near. Yes. And nowhere there's a near very this. good article on our website by a certain D. Whiskum on alphabet shares. Is it really? Yes, if you Google alphabet shares and BKL, mm -hmm. um, you will see a great deal more there. And there's lots of other tax goodies on the website. So feel free to have a look. But as far as we're talking so, here, we're just talking about a UK company with plenty of flexibility. Um, so, so then we've got, then we've got a, um, what, what, what do we have here? Oh, yeah, we've got a little picture. Yes, which just um, summarises really what we've talked yeah. about, doesn't it? So you've got a limited or unlimited company. You might, you might typically have um, the parents, and I'll talk about the trust for the next generation, whether the parents hold the shares or whether those shares are held in trust, because there's a particular point that we, we come to at, at, at this point. Um, so there are, there are voting shares, point direct, directors typically have no dividend or capital rights. Um, and somebody else, the next generation, or perhaps a trust for the next generation, have non-voting shares, um, and um, they have the right to dividends, but only if the voting shares vote them. Right. And those are shares in limited or mm -hmm. unlimited company. And at the point at which this this structure is set up, of course, um, these shares are valueless. There's nothing in the company at this point. Correct. Um, just worth mentioning that 
this is if we're going to shift things around, gift shares, put them into trust. At this point, there's no value. Yes, well, this is where the difference between loan and preference shares might be relevant as well. In preference yeah. shares, yeah, yeah, there might be some value. Yeah. But typically, yes, you fund it by way of a loan. Yeah. So the balance sheet is cash, less creditors, comes down to nil. So, yes, there can't be any value shifting. There's yeah. nothing to value to shift. So what happens next? Um, well, what happens next is perhaps that the parents or indeed the siblings uh, transfer assets to the uh, company and the uh, the proceeds are left outstanding on loan accounts. So again, at this point, um, no um, value has passed into the uh, limited or um, uh, unlimited company. Um, this loan is because we're transferring for for full value and, and uh, we're uh, uh, we're uh, an effect, effectively replacing the asset with uh, with debt. Now you need to consider what the terms of the loan might be. Well, it may be it could be interest bearing or yeah. not interest bearing. Um, it could be repayable on demand or not repayable on demand. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's a, let's think about the accounting issues that arise if the loan is not repayable on demand. Do we have any accountants in the room? Uh, oh. Just the one. Ah, oh, splendid. So, <laughs> David, David's curveball is all about FRS 102, I think. Uh, and where you have interest free loans these days, you may have to effectively discount that loan um, for the fact it's uh, interest free or bearing interest at less than market rates. And whereas, in my simple world, if I lent a company £100,000, it would show a creditor of £100,000 in its balance sheet. You don't anymore. Um, you may show it as a lower value that accretes up over the lifetime of that loan. And the difference between the 100000 in my example, you put in and the 80000 you recognise is deemed to be a sort of capital contribution. And you can kind of see where they're coming from. It's almost a gift to the company insofar as I'm not charging you interest on that. But... It certainly does complicate, in my mind, the accounting of that. The question is, how does the tax then be treated? Um, it all gets a little bit complicated. Um, broadly, my understanding is, and there's been at least three changes to the tax treatment since these rules were brought in, um, that credit um, or capital contribution is not taxable, nor do we get relief as we effectively make a charge to the P&L to match the increase in value of that loan from its carrying value up to the full £100,000 due on repayment. All rather complicated. I think we'll do that for another time. But yeah. none of that applies if it's repayable on demand, does it? Correct. So if you're on demand... That was the short answer, yes. On the loan repayable on demand, all of that nonsense I don't, that you've just been talking about and I don't understand is, yeah. is, is irrelevant because you simply then recognise the loan as a loan. And there's no reason it shouldn't be repayable on demand in these circumstances. Yeah. The other reason for perhaps making a loan repayable on demand is um, a, a loan made to a limited company that is repayable on demand is not regarded as a transfer of value for IHT purposes. Um, a loan that is um, perhaps a lo a less, than a, less than a market interest rate and has you know, is, is, has a track to future time. Mm -hmm. um, then may well be regarded as a transfer of value. Begs the question whether a transfer of value for a limited company is an immediately chargeable transfer or not. And there is a slight difference of opinion on that. Um, under um, Section um, 3A of the Inheritance Tax Act, um, the, if, if the uh, transfer of value is um, comprised in the estate of another individual, then it's a pet. Mm -hmm. But of course, this isn't comprised in the estate of another individual. If it increases the value of another individual's um, estate, then again, it's potentially um, a pet, but only if the transfer doesn't itself become part of the estate of some other person. And the issue is whether on making a transfer to the company, the asset becomes part of the estate of the company and therefore um, precludes the um, the. the it precludes it from being a pet. Now, there's a difference of opinion on whether the company can actually have an estate. Right. Um, so um, the question about whether there is a transfer of value or an immediately chargeable transfer on, on transferring value into a company is, is not completely clear. All right. Um, opinions. Vary. Okay. So what we're saying here is basically we're transferring assets and we're leaving the proceeds outstanding. Okay. 
on on right. them. And okay. we should just complete this mention the point that if we are transferring investments, properties, of course, we need to consider CGT, SDLT, etc. on course. transferring the assets across. So um, be careful. So if we are um, if 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 we are a, we're a partnership, of course, and we're selling um, a, 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 an investment property to a company, a partnership becoming an investment business, yeah, they're selling the asset. Then SDRT may be there may be no SDRT in in some circumstances. So SDRT and partnerships and incorporation are all a bit um, a bit interesting. And they we are. Could, we could do another seminar on that. We could. Should we start one at two? No. <laughs> Um, so there, so there's the, the possibilities. Um, question: Can the funding by parents reduce their estate? Somebody is asking. Um, well, it could do. You could pass value to the company, which would reduce the parents' estate, but you would then potentially have a charge to um, IHT on the on, on the transfer. Okay. So it there is huge flexibility here. Okay. Um, so then we've got, um, so we've now got the, the, the um, limited or unlimited company. Um, we've looked at the consequence of the loan, IHT, okay. accounting, income tax treatment. Uh, consequence of the loan, well, we could, we've got this debt owed by the company to the parents. That debt is worth what it's worth. Yeah. Um, and uh, we could, perhaps, if we wanted to get that out of the estate, somebody's asked, um, can, can the, um, the, the, the estate be reduced, but it can be because the parents may then pass that debt itself across to um, uh, the next generation or to a trust for the next generation. You're going to have the same inheritance such consequences with trusts as you would with other, with, in any, any other circumstances. You're still going to potentially have a, um, an immediately chargeable trust. So you're talking about assigning the debt? Assigning the debt. Right. I think if we press the right button, it's even, it might even move across, is it? Good Lord, let's try. Oh, oh. that's good, isn't it? Yes. I'm so impressed. Yes, my my uh, my life has uh, not been entirely wasted. Um, <laughs> so yes, you could have sat, you could transfer the um, the debt across or imp But what the, but typically what I'm thinking of here is the parents wouldn't assign the debt. They transfer the asset across and leave the proceeds outstanding. But then the capital growth of the asset or indeed right. the income on the asset would accrue to the benefit of the company. Mm -hmm. And the and parents perhaps would be repaid the debt over their remaining lifetime in order to meet their living expenses. So what they've done effectively is spent the capital, yep. but allowed the income and the capital growth to accrue in a tax favoured environment in the company. So that's that's what I'm okay. envisaging. Um, worth what those the people who sell these things are envisaging, um, and indeed. Uh, so we've got the, the IHT and uh, income tax consequences. What's any income tax consequences of the debt transfer? Well, not if you're um, transferring the debt to um, minors or um, to a trust for minors would, of course, be a settlement. Yeah. The income would be taxable on the parents. But I'm here. I'm envisaging perhaps transferring to um, adult children um, where there would be no income tax consequences okay. of, the, of the debt transfer. Um and then this is shows this is not in fact the consequences of debt transfer at all. This is a, <laughs> this is repayment, isn't it? Um, oh well. Um, so what this is merely um, showing what happens when the yield from the investments goes into the limit, unlimited company or the limited or unlimited company and is then used to repay the debt owed to the uh, parents, which they then go and which is yeah spend. tax free. Yeah, they will go and spend. Um, so, when you reflect at the points here, um, the company's then going to invest those funds. Yeah. It will pay corporation tax. Yeah. I mean, the whole purpose of these is this is a low tax wrapper, is, is the gist of it, isn't it? 19% rate of corporation tax at the moment, mm -hmm. dropping to 17% uh, from 2020. So, I, I'm given to understand, yes. Yes. So, um, so the value accrues within the company. It's, it's, just worth thinking for a moment about whether this is a settlement and um, whether the settlement rules can be applied to any of these arrangements. And again, it's not 100% clear. I think it's probably 99% clear, um, but it's not completely. Because there is no doubt that making an interest-free loan mm -hmm. is a settlement. 
Yep. It is an arrangement. It's a bounteous arrangement. arrangement. Yep. So it is a settlement. So that's that's not difficult. Um, the question is, is it such a settlement as is caught by the legislation? Right, yes. And as results in the income of the settlement being taxed on the settlor. Um, now, if it does, then that, I don't know say it holds this below the waterline, but it certainly doesn't do it any favours in terms of uh, the, the tax planning. And uh, the legislation on, on um, um, settlements uh, treats the income of the income under, arising under a settlement as income of the settlor. Um, if the settlor is, has retained interest in the property, if there are any circumstances in which the property, which would be the amount of the, the asset that's, that's transferred across, is, or any related property is payable to the settlor or the settlor's spouse or applicable for the benefit of the settlor or the settlor's spouse or will or may become so payable or applicable. So I think the, the, the best analysis would be that the income arising under the settlement is not applied to the benefit, cannot be applied to the benefit of the, of the settlor, of the, of the parent. Right. What's happening is that the, the, um, the uh, parent is merely being paid the capital price of the asset that's being sold and merely deferring the payment for the, um, the, the, the price for the capital asset um, is not, I think, um, retaining a benefit in the, in the, in the settlement, even though in, in, in cash flow terms, the settlement, the income of the settlement is being used to, to, to buy the capital. Um, so I think, I think we're OK on the settlement provisions. But if you've got any doubts at all, then, of course, the thing to do is to have the company invest for capital growth when you certainly don't have any problems right. with the settlement provisions um, because there's, there's no income arising. Um, so um, the other the other um, um, so we've looked at the corporation tax consequences, the receipt of the, 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 and the income taxes. The effect on the value of the voting and non-voting shares. Well, this is a very interesting, <laughs> a very interesting point. What are the voting and the non-voting shares worth? So the parents have the shares that cannot themselves benefit. They cannot declare dividends to themselves on the shares. Mm -hmm. They do have the power to vote shares on the dividends. Sorry, to vote dividends on on the other shares. shares yes. Um, what does that make the voting the, share, the voting and the non-voting non -voting shares worth? Well, you could argue, you could argue that the um, because the voting shares cannot themselves derive any benefit, they must be worthless. Yeah, the, I can the, see the point. Know, the power to mm -hmm. vote shares on somebody else's uh, vote dividends on somebody else's shares is, is no value at all. And you could also value the non-voting shares are worthless. Because they have no right to anything, they only have right to such dividends as the voting shares declare on them. Something doesn't add up there. So you've got a company that is valuable, mm -hmm. but none of the shares in the company actually have any value. Okay. Which is would be a good trick um, if you could turn it. Um, I suspect the problem would be that although the, 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 the voting shares would have a significant value um, to the non-voting shareholders, because if the non-voting shareholders can get hold of the voting shares, they've got everything. They've got they? everything. Mm. So the non-voting shareholders will be prepared to pay a significant price. Therefore, when you look at the open market value of the voting shares and the price that would be paid by a hypothetical purchaser, now in 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 the valuation assumption is not that you um, that you um, are selling to a special purchaser. We will start selling to a hypothetical purchaser who isn't a special purchaser. However, that hypothetical purchaser would inevitably have regard to the fact that there is a special purchaser in the background, namely the holder of the non-voting shares, and, would, and that would influence the price that a hypothetical purchaser would pay for the voting shares. So you might get over that, I think, by imposing a restriction on the transfer of the voting shares to ensure that they couldn't, in fact, be held by the same people that were holding their non-voting shares, which would take the special purchaser out of the picture altogether and would therefore reduce the value of the voting shares to essentially a ransom value. So, that's, so the, the value of the voting shares and the non-voting shares is quite interesting. Of course, they're worth nothing when the company is set up and they're worth nothing when the assets being transferred for market value. Right. But as value accrues mm -hmm. within the company, um, the, the, the voting or non-voting shares may become valuable. So you might therefore want to put the voting shares into a trust 
in to ensure that any value that does accrue in them is outside of the mm -hmm. parent's estate um, and um, but the trust of which the parents are trustees so the trustees continue to so that so that they continue to have um, have voting control okay this is all rather interesting <laughs> You want to move on to other tax issues then? Because I think we've covered the points about the debt. Are there any questions there we're, we're prepared to answer? No, absolutely not. Okay. Well, okay. Right. What's, uh, you may know this one, David. Yeah. You may not. What's the difference between this structure, so family investment company, and a loan trust bond where the growth is outside the settler's estate? Any, any thoughts? Uh, well, they, they, apply, they apply very similar principles. Um, I suppose what I would say is this, is this um, structure allows the control over the um, investments um, to retain to remain with the um, with the parents themselves and gives the flexibility within the company structure to um, uh, to to uh, deal with the company's assets in whatever way uh, seems appropriate okay uh, Ainsley asked a question we talked about shares for the next generation can these protect be protected against a future divorce of the shareholder, i.e. so there can be no claim on the shares by the divorcing spouse? I think this means if the next generation get married and then get sadly yeah. divorced. I think um, I think one could um, deal with that either uh, by careful drafting of the articles or the shareholders agreement or if all else failed um, by holding the shares in trust for the next generation. Um, I think the concern is that um, although you might be able to stop a divorcing spouse from getting um, his or her hands on the shares themselves, um, I think the, it's likely that a court uh, might be willing to um, attach a value to the shares themselves. Right. Um, so although the shares themselves would be retained by the by the um, um, by the person you want to retain the shares. It would, the, the divorcing spouse might then be able to have a, because it would be part of the, the marital estate, it, it might lead to the divorcing spouse having a claim on some other part of the um, of the uh, couple's assets. So in other words, you wouldn't ignore it, right? Uh, but you might be able to protect that particular mm -hmm. asset from the uh, from the divorcing spouse. Okay. Um, what other tax issues have we got? Um, oh yes, well yes, well the company could. Um, could in principle borrow um, yep. to uh, make some investments um, and the attraction of this is if the company were to borrow you know all about corporation tax don't you I've heard of it yeah yes um, I'm given to understand companies generally speaking get tax relief for interest don't they they generally do on generally on an accounts basis so unlike a trust if a trust borrows to buy investments and ignoring land for a minute, but if it buys to a portfolio of quoted shares, a trust gets no relief for those that interest costs, does it? Yeah, it's quite extraordinary, really, but can't but, argue so, with it. But mm -hmm. a company does, so you've got Correct. this. It, it, it means that um, borrowing to gear the portfolio becomes more efficient than, than in a trust. Yeah. Similarly, management fees, um, trustees don't get tax relief for management fees. Um, company, generally speaking, does. Yeah, so again, just it's all subject, really, just to general principles, isn't it? As long yeah. as they're wholly and wholly and exclusively incurred and, and reasonable, then it should all be tax deductible. You might have, if interest is payable to the shareholders, you may only get relief in the year of payment if they're deferred, but it's just a timing issue. But essentially, what this is saying is that the is the um, the tax environment for a limited company or an unlimited company, the tax environment for a company is rather more favorable than that for a trust yep. generally mm -hmm. um so if so it, the, all of these things um you've got um, the um, directors you might pay remuneration to the directors um you'd only be able to pay i think um I and mean, if, if the directors were the parents who had settled the um capital in the first place or loaned the capital in the first place um i think in order to avoid problems with the gift subject reservation you'd want to ensure that a director's remuneration was restricted to market value. Yes. Um, and you pay again, this is for general tax planning, isn't it? Depends what income they have as individuals. If you know the parents have retired, then it clearly makes sense to try and make use of their um, personal allowance. Yeah, exactly, mm. exactly. Um, you've got then, then the, um, the uh, directors or the, the controlling parties, I might exercise their discretion to vote a dividend 
and that dividend would be taxable in the in the normal way, depending on whether it's held by trust, that miners, where, mm-hmm. where the settlements legislation would apply. But you might roll up the, the, the income within the company and then pay out a dividend to the miners after they stop be, being miners. Absolutely. So that the legislation would then not Yeah, there's been dividend. some case law, we digress slightly, on paying directors' fees to children as well, haven't they, and whether they can be paid a salary. I think it was one case we saw recently where dad had basically been paying his son's Tesco alcohol bill, hadn't he, and treat, claimed it was just... I thought all just, everybody did that. Well... It's fair enough, isn't it? Oh, but he was claiming tax relief for it as well. Yes, he? he was oh, claiming right, this was. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, he was claiming this was, these payments were just on account of his director's fees, and the fact he gone and spent money in Tesco's was neither here nor there. Mm. And the revenue said, "Come on, let's be sensible and deny tax relief." So, in principle, though, we can pay, but be yeah, careful the, the, with the, miners. The, the classic case was um, Copeman and Flood in uh, the 1930s, I think. Um, where the revenue rather took exception to the children being paid rather higher levels of remuneration than the, than the chairman of the Board of Inland Revenue was being paid at that time. <laughs> and I think that was what really upset them. Um, and, yeah, same principle applies, to get relief for what was reasonable but not what wasn't. Yeah, so let's not be too aggressive, I think, is, is the message with a lot of this. A uh, couple of questions. Daryl's a little curveball from Daryl. What about an LLP structure? Could we use an LLP instead of a, a company? Um, we could do, but the problem with LLP is that it's um, if, if, you're indiv- if you have individual members in an LLP, and then of course it's, it's transpa- tax transparent. Yes, yeah, so, you're so gonna, the income is going to be taxed at uh, yeah, we've, at income tax. We've rate. lost the benefet of the the low tax wrap, haven't we? I mean, they used yeah. to be all the rage, didn't they? It was exactly the sort of yeah. standard plan. You've had you'd have corporate members of an LLP, and that would, in many respects, give you the best of both worlds. Mm. Um, but sadly, with the mixed partnership rules, those days of have gone. Um, well, would... it's becoming more difficult. Let's not say they've gone. Well, okay. give a little more right. imagination. To <laughs> deal with. Fair enough. So, time marches on, David. Just a few little bells and whistles and refinements, just to mention. Yes. Well, you, you, you could think you could think about. We've talked about the parents essentially having um, only the right to um, have their loan repaid. Yeah. Um, if that if that doesn't suit. Then it's possible you could contemplate the, the shares and the parents themselves having some valuable shares, um, retaining you know, part of the capital growth or you know, perhaps dividend rights. This is where preference shares might come in. Yeah. Um, where you might have um, um, dividends payable on the shares. Um, you might also um, think about um, what I've described as flowering shares. There, we've talked about the, stru- the basic structure being where the parents have the voting shares and somebody else has non-voting shares. Well, one assumes that at some point these um, these uh, people who have the non-voting shares will become sufficiently responsible um, to exercise voting control themselves. Yeah. Um, at some point. Yeah. Um, so it is, you, you could envisage putting into this structure shares where the voting rights passed across from one generation to another as the mm-hmm. uh, over a period of time flowering. Yeah, flowering votes as, a, as I've called them. Um, care needed, but again, you would need some care. You also need to have a little bit of care about Section um, um, 98 of the Inheritance Tax Act, talk about alteration in capital, because there's potentially an inheritance tax charge mm. where the where the rights attaching to shares alter. But if those rights are built into the shares and are predetermined flowering rights, and um, then I think I think you'd be okay. But yeah. it's, it's it's an issue that you would need to need to look at. And similar employment related security. Exactly, so I think same, you'd exactly argue the same principle. Exactly the same principle. They've not received them by virtue of necessarily their either family directorships. This is because of family relationships yeah. and you may yeah. may have a, de- a defendable position there, but yeah. caution is needed. And we've talked about limited or unli- unlimited liability um, and the reasons why you might want one or the other. And I suppose there's Substantial shareholding exemption ought to be on the previous slide because unlike trusts in the right structure, a company can not pay tax on shares in trading companies if it has the right investments in yes. trading businesses. I mean, to, yes, it would have to be more than 10%, held for a year, etc. But yes, absolutely. Again, companies are pretty good vehicles is all we're saying these yeah. days, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so you can press them into service to do things that perhaps the Victorians didn't imagine, imagine them doing when they invented the limited liability company. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, 
to summarise, David. Right, so what do they work for? Well, principally, I think investment assets, um, uh, principally where you're aiming to pass either future income and or future growth down the generations, where you want to retain control and probably where you want to accumulate wealth rather than distribute it because of the, the tax charges on, on um, the value coming out of the structure by way of, by way of dividend. All right. Uh, so I think that's about uh, what we have, except to say...